little bit. So why don't we uh, just get, get started. Um, hello and welcome everyone to the first wet cement press kitchen table reading. Uh, I'm Thoreau Lovell, the publisher of Wet Cement Press. Uh, we're a new press, uh, started last year. We're based in Berkeley, California, but with editors in um, Reno, Nevada, Bisbee, Arizona, and Asheville, North Carolina. Um, last year, our first year, we did five books. This year, I think we're on track to do four or five books as well. Um, so as you guys all know, or, or I suspect you know, that today's readers are Andrea Clark Libin, reading from her new wet cement press book, Orphan of the Moon, and Ninzo John High, also reading from his new wet cement press book, Without Dragons, Even the Emperor Would Be Lonely. So Andrea and John had readings scheduled in Boston and at Burl's bookshop, poetry bookshop in Brooklyn, and something at, I think, Paris Lit Up in Paris, and even, even something at the uh, venerable Shakespeare and Company in Paris. I think that was more of a creative transformation uh, event, not really a poetry reading. But nevertheless, we've had to cancel, and rightfully so, and glad to do it, cancel all of these events. And like virtually everyone else, we're gonna give the Zoom reading format a try. Um, so this is our first try at it. I want you to hope you can all bear with us as we grapple with the technology and the distancing that sort of comes along with it. We hope to make this a regular series where we'll do readings every couple of weeks or so. So speaking of Zoom, um, I'm gonna check if anyone's in the waiting room. I can hear the, uh, the beep going off, uh, so I know there are. So give me a moment to let them in and I'll be right back. So I just wanna take a moment and say, you know, in these, these difficult and sort of troubling, trying times, we really had to think about whether to bring these books out now or not. And we went back and forth quite a bit with John and Andrea and myself, trying to decide if this was the right thing to do or not. And uh, at the end, we decided to go ahead and do it as a kind of offering. Um, and I think in that spirit, I would like just to go ahead and begin uh, the reading. So I'm gonna hand things over to my good friend and fellow editor at Wet Cement, Michelle Murphy, and she's gonna introduce Andrea. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm super excited to uh, be here to introduce Andrea Clark Libin. And I wanna just do a little bio and talk about her new book just a bit. Andrea Clark Libin's work has appeared in Paris Lit Up Magazine, Poetry Northwest, Talisman, a journal of co contemporary poetics, Kadir Haas University's Culture and Arts Journal, Zen Monster in downtown Brooklyn. Her new book, Orphan of the Moon, Notebook of a Girl in a Moscow Station, is a slim but powerful hybrid novella of prose poems, drawings, and collages. The immediacy and dark lyricism of her writing straddles a world both gritty and resolute, as well as hauntingly tender. To read this novella with its found fragments, offhand drawings, and damaged characters means walking through the sputtering lights of a Moscow train tunnel in a state of makeshift prayer. We are born children of blood, orphans of the moon. I'd like now to welcome Andrea to read from her gorgeous book from Wet Cement Press. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that beautiful introduction and those beautiful words. And throw, uh, I'm thrilled to um, be here with you all in this strange space where I'm seeing people from France and uh, Portugal and New York and other parts of the world. So amidst all this, it's pretty amazing. And thank you for coming. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, the book is dedicated to my mom and dad. They haven't seen the new version yet, but they're listening today. So I'm gonna read from the beginning. And um, yeah, if you just as Thoreau said, if you have a chance to mute on the bottom left, 
Um, we are parented by air, siblinged by glue. I will school you. Breathe in the vapors and the fumes will crawl into your heart, haunt you like a shadow, ragged eyeballs. This much I can tell you. Put one ear to my chest, the other to my lips. Ivan was the one to find me huddled in a pistol in the station, weeping fits of woe. Mama, mamushka, why have you gone to church to pray and left me to weep, weep, weep? Ivan rescued me to the tunnels, sheared my head so I'd look like a boy, so bugs wouldn't creepy crawl my pretty braids. Ivan nabbed stray dolls and stuffed bears dropped unawares by tiny top fingers. He'd find them on the terminal floor, wide-eyed like corpses. Yvonne lined the dolls up on an empty apple crate where I slept, placed a yellow-haired girlie on my cardboard mat. Yvonne big-brothered me till he was vapored by a glue, vampired by the night. His heart was hollowed out and he evaporated in the night. Now the dolls mock me with their plastic stares. We seep out of hiding as day breaks. The station sanctuaries us in the crack between dawn and morning, a truce of daylight, a promise never met. You might have felt the solace, lighting candles in a church, but we don't pray here. We suck in air, glue, try to hold on. Don't let go. Then the rush, rush, rush parades through and we're the nuisance, guilting you on your morning commute. Shoo, shoo, you say, toss us a kopeck. Pretend we're not co-tailing you for coin. Try and forget our marushka stares, our glue dripping noses before the metro doors clang shut and you're home safe, comrade. Only you will hear my whispers when you say your goodnight prayers. We were born children of blood, orphans of the moon. Dark spits at me, I spit back. We don't count days here. You would be afraid, but I'm not. Sleep whispers, flutters her breath, hot on my cheeks, eyelashes. Stay awake here for a week and you become immortal. But we don't count days. I'm not fooled by sleep, she's sneaky tries to push you into the black hole, taunts you. Somewhere out there is the Milky Way. Orange peels, skates, potatoes roasting in the earth, a mattress of peacock feathers, wool mittens. Don't worry, I'm no fool. I don't wish for things like mama, mamushka, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Sparks fleck the darkness. A train hums through the walls against my fingertips. Last licks of a candle singes out. Night burns, beckons. You would be duped, not me. We don't count days here. When Ivan found me in the pistols, he cut off my braids with his knife. Hopscotch snagged me a crate. They tucked me in near the steam pipes, ran a lighter to flash their names, tagged on the wall in neon green. Hush, hush, they hummed, fed me a candy bar, took drags off a cigarette in the darkness, told me she'd be back for me in the morning till I fell asleep to their whispers. Day glared through the station and they schooled me in their ways, filching cigarettes, donuts, candy, glue, Dodging cops, pedophiles, gangbangers, all the while palms out for kopecks, food, disdain. Lend me your ear. His hair was shaved. In the photo at the bottom of my mother's purse, he was smiling in the darkness of lipstick, tissue, mints, dried up perfume. 
His army check arrived in the mail. A pittance, Mamushka cried, but I knew she was crying for his being stationed at the end of the world. The front, they called it, in the newspapers, but we knew better. The end, we chorused. We were a village of mamas and girls and the great unwashed. We packed sausages and cheese and rode on the train to Moscow. I drew pictures of a girl in braids pretending to smile back at the man in the photo. Now I'm not fooled when I glimpse him in a crowd of soldiers at the edge of the terminal, duffels at feet, downing beers and clouds of cigarette smoke, a shaved head, a flash of smile. Papa, Papa, I hum inside but he's just another stranger, belongs to some other girl, wife, and he's back toasting his mates before he ends off to the end, before I can even pretend he's mine. Ivan was fading away. Here's a secret I won't tell you. The forgetting took nights of a raw bone stomach bruised out eyes, lips. I tattooed the remembering on gun wrappers, matchbooks, apple crates, pistols in the palm of my hand. I worked for the forgetting, owned it in hard currency, sealed out the flickers like windows coated in black paint, but the remembering steeped through the cracks of broken glass, paper puppets, shadowing curtains, a girl on a frozen light cartoons in daylight, beets roasting in the ground, frost on eyelashes, freckles on a pale shoulder. Afternoons, we run the tracks, daredevil each other out of boredom, hop scotch the third rail for the glory, swipe beer from vendors, ride the cars, Guzzle from glass bottles and jungle gym the handrails. Beat on windows. Babushkas lament our hooligan ways, our blackened fingernails, runny noses, our lost souls. We laugh and spit and drink and sing to the motherland. We steal their after school pocket change, bruise apples and candy and stale lunches all, and stale lunches. Most of all, we steal their shit-eating grins. Yvonne said we were on a mission to save the world, the downtrodden. Hopscotch got a raider for the good-for-nothing fucking bastards. Bumps then filches their wallet before they say abracadabra shazam. Police never outrun Hopscotch. He marathons the subway stairs raising his arms like Rocky in the movie poster, and he's gone, poof, vanished into the tunnels, leaves them cursing his soul, panting like dying dogs. On a good day, Hopscotch lays out his loot. Wads of rubles, photos of blonde women with frosted hair, fat-faced men with arms around their waist, children with idiot smiles in school uniforms, Learning lies, Ivan would say. Lying awake at night, she's finding me everywhere, peering inside cupboards, baskets, under beds, down dead end alleyways. She never stops, never gives up, combs through classrooms, pawn shops, prostitute faces, scours hospitals, charts, rides in police cars, eyeballs mug shots. She looks everywhere but here because you forget that when you're searching for something you never find what you lost until you give up looking. A name on the tip of your tongue, a ring, keys, your only girl. You have to forget all about the looking. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrea such a great reading. I'm going to flip back and see if I'm really, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm sure everybody got a sense of the text. I mean, what amazingly rich and layered text it is. 
but there's another side to this book and that's the visuals. It's really a stunning book that honestly, Andrea should get full credit for. She did all the collages, she did all of the boards and sent them to me and I simply reproduced them as she had created them. So before I introduce the next reader, I wanted to show you a couple of those pages. Just give me one moment. There's only one copy of this book that's in existence at the moment, I happen to have it here. <laughs> More on the way, though, don't worry. <laughs> so um, first I should show you the cover. This is the front cover. Um, this gives you a sense of the, the kind of graphics inside of the book. And then um, let me just get to the right page here. Almost all of the pages, let's see, can you see that? All of the pages have this torn notebook feel to them. Um, and some have more of a collage and, uh, well, graphic elements to it. And then finally, one of the most stunning set of pages in the book is this one. I don't know if you can see it. So um, it's as lovely as a book, as, as an object book, as it is a text. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, as many of you know, the book, Andrea's book is available for pre-order now. And those of you who have, who have pre-ordered it, I really appreciate it. It's fantastic to see orders coming in. Um, those of you who might be interested in it, you can buy it. You can get it from the Wet, Wet Cement Press website. Um, right now, there's a 20% discount code, um, which is Orphan20. That's O-R-P-H-A-N 20. Um, but if you can't remember the, the discount codes, it doesn't matter. There's a page you can go to on the website, which is wetcementpress.com slash discounts. And it'll show the discounts for, for the books that are active right now. Okay. So our next reader is Zen monk, poet, and translator, Ninzo John Hai. He's the author of numerous books, many on Talisman Press, and the recipient of a number of awards, including Fulbright's National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, and most recently, a National Endowment for the Humanities to translate Os Osip Mandelstam, all of which you can read about on the Wet Cement Press website. So I've known John for a long time, and I have to admit that I'm still getting used to this Ninzo thing. And even though he's told me about his Zen name almost 20 years ago, all these years, I, th I thought Ninzo meant deep sound, which kind of made sense to me re in regards to John. But just recently, I learned that it actually means enduring monk, which also makes sense. In any case, John's Zen name is important in the context of his new book, Without Dragons, Even the Emperor Would Be Lonely. It's a book of Enzo's parables and koans in the Zen tradition that engages, that directly engages John's daily Zen practice in a way that his other books have not. Each piece in Without Dragons is an Enzo or painting and handwritten text created together in a single city. So I'm gonna show you a couple of pages from this book as well. Uh, here's the cover with an Enzo on it. Um, Oops. Here's uh, an Enzo with the handwritten poem. Hopefully you can see that. And um, a couple more. And then just one final one I want to show because it's a different field than the others. Here we go. So it's a stunningly beautiful book. Like I said, each of these paintings and poems were really written or created together in a single sitting. Um, uh, Uche and Duca has said that it's a beautiful book for our perilous times and beyond, a call to dream deeply while awake. And Forrest Gander has said, their moments of attention come alive within us as though we were all nested in each other. Without Dragons is also available for pre-order now. And with that, I want to welcome John High. 
And so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Thoreau. That was uh, really um, you know, just a very warm and uh, welcoming uh, introduction. I really appreciate uh, that and our friendship over these uh, past decades. So thank you. And thank you, everyone who's here. Uh, I get to see a lot of your faces. I can't see everyone, but uh, I really feel uh, uh, just a kind of camaraderie of, of some sort and uh, it was just so um, uh, so powerful uh, hearing uh, Andrea where I uh, wasn't heard but I was just gonna say hearing Andrea's work was so inspiring for me because we've been on this continuous pilgrimage over the past year while she's been working and, and I as well but she's been working particularly on this children of the blood children of blood <laughs> excuse me, Orphans of the Moon, and uh, we've been down going on boats down the Mekong River and in Cambodia and doing our various readings and workshops and in, around Europe and Asia, so to see this book to completion is uh, actually even um, more satisfying than seeing my own. Nonetheless, I have a, a, a book too, and um, so I'm going to begin um, I'm going to begin with reading a recent piece uh, in, uh, that connects to the book itself and more particularly seems to me and for me uh, about the world we're living in now and uh, what really is uh, a plague and all of the impoverishment and really social injustice that comes with it and all we're experiencing. Uh, and at the same time, uh, what I think of as a sense of hopefulness that on the other side of it. There was never a time that didn't include you. Even if the others don't remember, it's fine, she says to the boy. No one will bother or care. That smell of apple and wood chip, a girl walking along the river, and she was you and knew it too. All of her hands shifting into birds or maybe balloons uh, floating out of your arms. You smell the corn seed in her hair and skin, the clips of madness also beautiful. And you hear the wind and love letters never written and already here and revealed now as you finally read them. The body softening after so much violence. Underwood Blue Jay, Stone Powell, River Run, Sky a Bit Undone. And full it was there, and there was a time, the door of the courtyard opening, a boy waiting, and you sense without asking, he too is part of you, has come for you, witnessed you. Here we are, a piece of wounded time. And wow, what a miraculous place to come home to. This is what the brush of ink is speaking to you right now as you prepare to leave the dream or enter it again. And that's from the girl's diary. And now I'm going to read uh, the book, as uh, Thoreau uh, mentioned, is a compilation of Enso's parables and koans, and you saw some of the uh, insos, and uh, I'm going to read a little bit of the, from the beginning here of the short koans. They're quite short, so I just pause between them, and I myself think of koans in the Zen tradition as little stories of poems that mean what they mean when you understand them for what they mean to you and not someone else, but to you. It is the page that speaks. The words are alive. A whiteness of scrolls pulling your being toward the sea. Just as you in this moment's passing, the sea lingers in a word and voice between the light and dark. This is no other than who you are. It 
in the koan, the man is walking too. Uh, do you remember? I remember, yes. The lost children are walking too, following you now in the dream. Why would they follow me? Dreams are words, so you sip the tea, finish the cup. When you sip this tea, you drink the sea. The body speaks. When you hear it, you awaken in the dream. And the dream dreams you. The world is not what the world is. It is what you are. Look, someone is waiting for you. And the boy plunges into the hand and the hand speaks. The sea swaying in the sky and the brush teetering on the edge of the hand. You think you know what it means and you never really needed to know. A sea miraculous in its own language. So um, just a brief word on the uh, Inso's uh, throw uh, spoke to it a little bit. I was just looking at uh, this one that accompanies that particular koan. And um, I was thinking about Kaz Tanahashi, who was, I think of uh, as a teacher and mentor to me, a, a, a great artist and Zen master. And um, he speaks of uh, insos. These you really do an inso in one circle. Uh, it takes a lot more time to prep and clean up. Maybe two or three seconds. It's one stroke of the bra of the brush. <coughs> and he speaks of them uh, of them as a completion of the moment, a circle of life, uh, the meeting what he is in the moment. And I think very fondly of him in this way. Uh, he's in his eighties. He's uh, his hair is down below his shoulders and he doesn't speak much and he's a very intense man. And I asked him, I had the honor of doing a workshop with him for several, well, we were together for quite a while when I was with him, I asked him if I could pay him uh, to do an inso uh, for my book. And uh, Kaz looked at me for a long time, stared at me and he has a very long stare. So it felt like it was an hour. It was probably a good couple minutes. And then, he shook his head and he said, no, I won't do it. You do it. So um, it's uh, not a bad uh, mentor for me. I had to learn how to do it myself. Nowhere to go, no one to be, as if held up this being miraculous. The impermanence of impermanence in the eternal now of these faces of God. Um, I have a note here that um, for me, um, realization or insight of any kind is not only fueled by, but dependent upon imagination that we actually all are particles of light and energy, but our human perception won't allow us to, uh, to perceive that. Uh, so, and, uh, well, in a certain sense, the little prince summed it up best, the most essential things are only visible to the heart. And I, when I'm doing my daily meditation in these insoles each morning, uh, I think of them as their own kind of peculiar or particular uh, uh, manifestations of uh, a type of light in that moment. The dream is language. The mystery is the other. Reality is waking in this mystery. 
a bird in flight. So that's a little taste of uh, the uh, Cohen aspect of the book. And I'm going to read two short parables. Uh, the parable, parables are uh, something of what one might think of as a narrative, maybe not, uh, but maybe. And uh, there are 11 parables in this book, and I'm going to read two of them. And this is parable two. Once while you were sleeping, you heard the trains arriving. Or were these departures from an old station? There is only one track treading through the countryside and the stations themselves were without names. If there were passengers along the way, you only saw reflections of their faces through the windows. Though at one time, it is true, they had names and places, you are certain. And somewhere in the sleeping, there were once countries or nations or strumming, the strumming from a guitar or perhaps just the vibration along the tracks at each station. There were so many migrations and wars. You often wondered where you were or even who you were when your train pulled into the station. Now, some had been great cities, others villages or towns, and some too distant to describe. Yet there were mountains and rivers along the tracks, and at times there were populations and buildings too, too immense to recall. You remember the remembering most, its territory of skies and a constant humming along the tracks, in the faces, in the windows and doorways. <coughs> Looking out as you see all this, and it is as close as the voices you hear in the humming, almost like hymns or some human choir. Parable three. <clears throat> it was the man by the mouth of the river who wrote you the letter. His body like faded stones, aged water. You had waited for him a long time. Yet now you were unsure how long you had waited. Were you waiting for him or was he waiting for you? Somehow he and his dog brought you here. You recall, you recall following the path along the river to the sea, the egrets and gulls guiding when you were lost, the boy with one eye and the girl speaking in signs. Whole years passed as if sleeping through a movie, a mirror of shifting faces in the water's current. while resting in the shade of a eucalyptus and washing your only shirt, you saw a child peeking through the mango. Was that only another reflection from the river? There is no way of telling who is who or who is you. Still, you recognize the mouth and eyes as only you could. It was not hard for you to understand where she came from as the girl handed you the old man's letter. Her swaying like salt in the sea. It was the old man who wrote the letter, yes. Though it is also true you could not yet decipher the words. An alphabet 
you still couldn't begin to remember. But when was that? How long had it taken you to arrive? You can trust the road is all you could hear from the wind coming out of the girl's mouth. Or was it coming out of her hands? You are the road is all you can ever remember. Thanks. Okay, I think Michelle you might want to unmute yourself. There you go. There I am. So I think we're going to try to do this Q and A. I've seen a lot of questions, or at least a lot of comments, come through. So we're going to see if we can just kind of take them from the top and uh, work our way down. Do you see the questions too, Michelle? Why don't you uh, start with the question, and I'll cipher through these and try to find uh, some questions. I'll, I'll start now. with my own question. Right there, you go. That's great. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, and this question is for both of you, how traveling has um, informed your work and informed your writing, and this, this, these books, this book in particular. <clears throat> really good question. Thank you. Well, travel really informs all of it, and in this book in particular, um came about actually when i first went to moscow um with john uh, and uh, my family's um, originally from russia on my father's side uh, and uh it was my first visit there um though i've been back a bunch of times and um we were in the train station and uh, I saw these kids and I saw this girl and uh, they were living in the station and uh, that was the spark for this book and uh, connects to a longer novel that I'm working on. Um, That's wonderful. <clears throat> And I'll just add it, it uh, the, what I call pilgrimage or travel uh, profoundly affected this book because it was written in a, a three week period in Cambodia that uh, we were doing our workshops with uh, kids in the village, village, a particular village outside of San Re, and with some teachers and social workers. But we were there for genocide day and with seven close to 70 percent of the population in cambodia is still under the age of 30 uh, which doesn't bode well for me uh, but it does give you a, a, a kind of uh, sense of how much the genocide is present so we were able to be there and the writing that came out of here in the in the insos there you are michelle the insoles themselves were more or less reflections of what was happening in that short period of time. And usually I don't write something that quickly. So I think all of the uh, travel is constantly a part of it. And, but this is, uh, in relation to your question, a very specific context that, uh, as with Andrea's book, the, uh, the seed and the execution was part of being in, a, in the world where you actually see not only the same kind of impoverishment and racism and hatred that we see in this country, but that you realize you just changed the numbers up a little bit and it's going on everywhere. Uh, and then the sense of hopefulness, uh, being there with the Cambodians, if you, I know our daughter Sasha has been there, but if you've ever been there, it's just uh, extraordinary. They, the uh, vibrancy of uh, people who have su survived the Khmer Rouge genocide and, uh, and just are like so gun ho on education and taking care of their kids and transforming the country. And it's, it's nothing short of inspiring, nothing short of inspiring. 
So I, I found a question in the chat from uh, Kelsey Brown, who's actually an intern with Wet Cement Press from Sacramento City College. So hi, Kelsey. And um, her question is, I mean, you already answered this sort of, Andrea. She said, your words are beautiful. What inspired you to write this? I also remember she mentioned to me when I first, when we were first talking about your book that she wondered if it was your story. If it was, you know, you were the person who had, you know, lived in the subway in Moscow and uh, just wanted to pass that on and get your reaction to that and your sense of just how deeply you had to engage with this material to write the book. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, uh, yeah, sort of um, entering into that space uh, and uh, with the notebooks. And um, so, yeah, in a way, you know, it is partly me, but of course, in no way am I, you know, in that position. So there's also a lot of sensitivity to writing about um, somebody who's living that kind of life mm. from, you know, my position. So I take that, you know, as well, very seriously. Of course, it's, you know, an imagined piece. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, had a, I have one for you from, let me see if I can find it, from um, Mila. Can you talk about your process? I'm sorry, John, you're getting ignored again for one more minute. Andrea, this is for you. Can you talk about your process of creating the collages that accompany the writing? Did they happen together? Did the writing come first? They're beautiful and I can't wait to see the book in my hands. Thank you. I think that's from Mila. Uh, incredible writer and artist. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, well, you know, uh, the writing started first, actually. I was writing about, um, I was, you know, kind of writing those pieces. And then, uh, you know, this idea of the journal being an actual uh, piece it, it became quite natural then to to start that and then they kind of became layered upon each other uh, after I'd written a lot of it uh, with the collages nice does that speak to that yeah. well there's so many you're gonna love seeing the chat transcript because there's so many uh, people wishing you guys well and so pleased to hear you read and amazed by the work um so we'll make sure that you get that um thank you if there's any other questions just go ahead and you know either unmute yourself and just ask it that's fine i guess at this point or um uh type it in really quick otherwise i think we're gonna move on um so well, I guess oh, I just wanted to add one more thing to Mila that sometimes the collage itself or a drawing or an image, yeah, you know, it worked the other way too, where the writing came out of that. Okay, sorry. Right. And there's some where the writing or the actual kind of narrative is really integrated into the collage, which uh, is really nice as well. So I want to thank both of you guys for really an amazing reading um, and for two amazing books, both so strong both from the point of view of the, the language and the meaning in that language and the visual impact of the books um, so beautiful work tremendous work um, i wanted to thank the other wet cement press editors uh, michelle murphy in reno um, anthony schlegel in bisbee arizona and barbara rother in Asheville, north carolina who i think are all online with us and our two interns from Sacramento City College, Kelsey and uh, yeah, what's her name? Uh, Is Isabel Burroughs, that's right, Izzy. I always forget what Izzy means. Um, so I want to thank you, thank them all for their help. Um, and also, but mostly I want to thank all of you. I mean, there's over 90 people showed up and oh that's God. fantastic, uh, wow. really beyond our expectations. Um, so thank you so much for that.
And um, one last reminder that both books are available now for pre-order. They're on the website, wetcementpress.com. If you forget the discount codes, just do wetcementpress.com slash discounts and you'll get all that information. Um, so I think we're gonna go ahead and maybe unmute everybody to say goodbye. And John and Andrea might wanna say their goodbyes, but thank you all. Well, I'm unmuted. And hopefully we will see you at the next, at the next oh, Say goodbye. Bye. 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 Unmuted. No, we're not muted. Wait a minute. Oh, Disney Magazine. Hey, Hi. 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 Can you hear us? Bye. 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 Right. Oh, I'm Donna from Turkey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Andrea. 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 Hi, Hey guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Like this. Ah, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, Bye, you guys. Bye, you guys. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, hey, Sasha, Katya. Hi. Nice to see you. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> it's really amazing. Wow, it's totally amazing. Congratulations. What it's a great wonderful earrings, by the way. It's totally it's amazing. <laughs> Oh my this goodness. is so fun. Yeah. Thank you. Look at all of this. This is really overwhelming, actually. And, and Michael Son, who's uh, there's Lillian is here. Oh. And Michael Son. Hey, who's Michael. Here. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's going to be awesome. reading Nancy. soon. Look at that. And Nancy. Oh, Nancy. Oh, and there's Florence. Yeah. Oh, so. oh look at Mike. Mike's down there. Oh. Hey, Mike. You keeping well, we Virginia say, together? We can't say everything. <laughs> But, um, oh, we can't say everyone. I'm yeah. sorry. Hi, me. Yeah. Nonetheless, Cousins, it's so good. Family, friends. Valentino. So many countries and places. Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> hi, John. Romeo. Hi. Oh, hi, Andrea. It's good to see you. Oh, so glad you're safe, you're safe Romeo. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. All right. Oh, I'm heading good. up. Bye bye. Good. There's Albert. Oh, my God. Awesome. Oh, people, there's Jeffrey. Well, anyway, we what a uh, what a wonderful feeling! Right this, this, yeah. this, Where do I know Jessica from? Hi, Jessica. Hi. <laughs> Where do I know you from? That's what Betsy did. Yeah. From LAU, Elspeth, from class. <laughs> oh, for God's sake! You change your hair. <laughs> it's dark now. Yes. Jessica. Oh yeah, yes. Jessica. Yeah. Your hair and I don't know you. It's it's sweet to see you. It's great. It's so good to see you. Yes. Bravo. Anyone else from school? Where's uh, Alicia Berbenek? I don't know. There's some. There are some students. Look at there's Murat. Hello, Murat. Hi. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you, Good to see you indeed. Fabulous. Wow. Wonderful. Do it again. This is beautiful. Yes. Great yes. idea. <laughs> Definitely do it again. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, really. Professor Hardy, hello, hello. Selena in England. Yeah. Okay. Want to see well, yeah. thank you all very much. We're very grateful. Uh, we're humbled by your presence and inspired by it as well. And let's all keep on doing the best we can in uh, these yeah. difficult times. Take care. Yes, here, here.